Good afternoon, everyone. Let's just allow the virtual room to fill up a little. While we do that, I'll start with the preliminaries and hopefully get them out of the way nice and quickly. So my name is Matthew Simmons and I'm with Economic Research Southern Africa. Um, and we have a program, um, the South African, uh, the SAMNET program which um, is the organizing partner in today's discussion. Um, it's the end of the year. I think we're all a little tired with well-orchestrated uh, seminars that are terribly predictable. So I'm hoping that today can be a little more chaotic and entertaining, possibly even useful, but let me not overcommit Let's see how we go. Um, we got a very interesting and sometimes amusing panel, a definitely experts in the topic that we are wanting to discuss today. We got uh, Christopher Lowell, the head of economic, the economic research department and chief economist at the Saab and member of the Monetary Policy Committee. We got Yolandi Smith the Acting Chief Director um, within the Economic uh, Policy Unit at the National Treasury of South Africa, Mamakete Lijani, Institutional Fixed Income Sales Trader and Macro Strategist at ABSA Capital Group, Nicola Vieggi, the Saab Chair in Monetary Economics. Unfortunately, Michael Sachs was unable to join us. Now, I just want everybody to take a quick break from emailing or paying traffic fines or whatever it is you do when you're listening to seminars and give me a minute of your attention. We really do value and welcome your contributions and encourage you to please engage with us in the Q&A and chat boxes. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A. If you have a comment, put it wherever you like. I will do my best to fold those contributions into the conversation. But importantly, please make your contributions public. Do not send them to just myself or the members of the panel. Um, we're going to proceed a little like this. Nicola is going to open up with an introductory and contextual presentation. And then going to ask Yolandi and Chris to give us their reflections. I'm then going to turn it over to our real world representative, Mamakete. Now, Mamakete, I'm relying on you to mix it up a bit and add a little bit of spice. Because if we leave it up to the others, we're just going to end up agreeing with each other within the policymakers' echo chamber. And then we're going to open things up and see where we go. We will close the discussion by asking each panelist to identify the most important policy failure we are making. Also, since we are a research institute, what is the research report you wish you could read, but it hasn't been written or hasn't been written properly yet? And the same question to the audience. I'd appreciate any of your views on that question. With all of that said, let me hand it over to Nicola to give us some kind of introduction and context. You put a high bar and you need to be entertaining. That's, that, that's the most important thing, Nicola. <laughs> and I resent the fact that you think I'm not in the real world. <laughs> we, nobody yeah. of us is. We are all in this uh, virtual uh, virtual presence. I'm I not like allowed. to say that, that real people live in a nominal world. Only yeah. nominal people <laughs> live in a real world. <laughs> Okay, I'll, uh, what I what I would like to do today is uh, to do just an introduction to the discussion is to use a uh, is to have a bit a, a bit an introduction uh, on uh, the monetary policy framework in South Africa. I mean, everywhere in the world now we are in a moment uh, of uh, reviewing the monetary policy framework uh, given the the changing condition and, and the the big shocks that we have been affected. We have seen like the you know the experience of the Federal Reserve or the European Central Bank with big uh, report on, on the monetary policy framework, and I think it's always important. It's always important of any uh, any framework, any any economic policy, especially uh, if in uh, in a democracy and transparency, to always be 
under scrutiny and also to uh, to really keep pace of what we learn from the academic point of view, like the things that we did in this uh, workshop, but what we learn uh, by uh, by the work that a lot of research, a lot of academics around the world, what we can learn that, is, that can be useful in thinking about the evolution of our macroeconomic framework that has been with us for quite for quite a long time. Therefore, this, uh, this presentation is sort of uh, one to put a few uh, a few issue on the table, particularly on two issues that are quite uh, in the debate and are quite in the uh, not only in South Africa but everywhere. One is the issue of we, which what inflation target or what is the target the monetary policy should have, and the other one is. Uh, what instrument can what other instrument other than interest rate can be useful in the process of stabilizing the economy especially in a in a small open economy uh, the monetary policy framework the way we know it is you know has been for us with us for uh, at least 20 years uh, a bit more actually now and is entrenched in the constitution for South Africa is one of these countries that has got one of the few places which actually depends on the central bank and very strongly uh, establish inside a sort of a, 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 a rigid constitution, therefore is, is announced at the constitutional level as a principle. And operationally, uh, from the 2000 has been uh, uh, organized around a sort of orientation and inflation targeting framework with a sort of, uh, how, what I say, a sort of high target and wide bands before quite a very sort of very flexible uh, inflation targeting framework to use the, the an expression of Svensson. And uh, with very limited intervention on the foreign exchange, uh, uh, with foreign exchange market, the foreign is uh, almost quite orthodox in uh, way of thinking about uh, the external environment, in which therefore monetary policy has to focus for the internal stability and the flexible exchange rate will provide the necessary uh, adjustment, external adjustment. And all this has been developed around strategy of uh, uh, communication uh, that has been actually remarkably transparent uh, up to you know publishing the expected path of interest rate that is not up at all a common future of uh, inflation targeting in any emerging country. And uh, with a significant in the communication now more and more forward guidance as therefore giving a sort of idea of the long-term uh, path of the policy and the uh, expectation and the expectation the, the bank expectation about future uh, the future of the economy all this though has been constrained or has been always a sort of uh, conflict with the external environment with the macroeconomic environment that especially after after the global financial crisis have become more and more uh, in which the economic growth is uh, is lower and lower. This one puts a lot of pressure on the on the fiscal side. Uh, we are experiencing high unemployment uh, with very strong hysteresis. So we had a paper yesterday by uh, Vincent really showing the uh, the characteristic of these hysteresis and how much specific shocks, especially shocks to nominal wages, shocks to uh, uh, shocks to uh, price markups really played a very important role. Therefore, it's really uh, almost a shock on the supply side were very, very important in determining uh, these path of uh, uh, of unemployment that we are, we are not able to shake uh, to shake off. And we are facing a very strong, a volatile external environment. And therefore, this interface between the country and the, the rest of the world, uh, that is the exchange rate to become, a or the, the interface of exchange rate and capital flows become a very, uh, very important uh, uh, policy variable or, or, or a, a sort of a variable of concern. It's not a variant, a variant of concern, but it's certainly a variable of concern. Uh, the question that, that I, you know, 
we like to to uh, to reason around is one is uh, is the current formulation of the policy target still adequate given both the internal and external conditions and should more more instruments come into play uh, to deal with the external with external shocks the the issue of the target you know the 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 characteristic of the target, the South Africa target, is is really at the extreme end of a very flexible inflation targeting regime. This one is uh, for all for all the country with uh, inflation targeting in the world. This is, is the middle inflation inflation target uh, uh, for most of the country. And South Africa is uh, at the upper end of the distribution, therefore is a quite a high inf inflation target compared to independently of emerging or developed countries there is there is really a very not a one-to-one -one relationship between low inflation target and development and vice versa therefore is uh, the choices were made uh, for very different reasons in very different places but this puts very south africa on the on the upper end of the distribution and is on the upper end also on the on the without the band Therefore, not only the target is high, but also there is a sort of a wider band of, uh, of uh, acceptable outcomes uh, around this band that make the, uh, the target is very flexible. And if you consider the experience of the after especially global financial crisis, this flexibility has been used uh, full force in some sense. Uh, therefore, that uh, you know, we, uh, the monetary policy has been, has been uh, I, I think, used a lot to absorb uh, to absorb the shock. So much so that inflation target actually for a long time became a sort of the upper end of the band. And therefore, actually, it was almost a six percent inflation target for a long time. And then only lately there has been a convergence around 4.5, but it's a convergence that is partly policy, partly. I say lack in the sense that a series of shock push inflation in the, towards the middle of the band, and therefore the communication then help to bring the expectation in line, and therefore the, the, we can really see uh, a very systematic uh, change in policy when moving from four to, to six, from four point five. But even four point five at the size, we are really at the upper end of the distribution of the kind of monetary policy you have in emerging market and in developed countries. What we know about the inflation targeting is that inflation targeting works when the target become a focal point and a coordination device. A focal point for private sector expectation, a coordination de device for the decision of the price makers in the economy. Uh, yesterday we have a very nice presentation by uh, by Monique, Monique Reed from the University of Stellenbosch, looking really specifically at the evolution of the inflation expectation of uh, uh, the business sector in South Africa at the micro level and what is the determine uh, the, if the target become a focal point for them or not and uh, where the uncertainty in terms of the formation expectation comes. And I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, interesting, interesting research that pinpoint also where the potential uh, uh, miscommunication or deep or necessary stronger communication might be might be necessary to make the inflation target a focal point. Define a trade-offs between clarity and probability of success. If the bandwidth is very wide, uh, the inflation target is meaningless because essentially we we define as acceptable any possible outcome around uh, around that uh, uh, that target. If the if the uh, therefore the target is meaningless, and therefore the inflation expectation, and the economy will go as if there was no inflation target. It will become very discretionary. If instead the inflation the the, the band is too too narrow, you uh, you need to be pretty sure to be able to control the economy in order to maintain the inflation in the band. Therefore, you, uh, if the band is too low, is too low, you, mean, you, you might miss the band uh, many times and therefore risk uh, the credibility of the system overall. Uh, 
Therefore, in this trade-off, there is the difficulty to find a space that give enough flexibility, but also give a clarity of signal so that the inflation target can become a, a focal point and a coordination device. What the thing is that the inflation targeting in some sense works. So if when it works, it really works in also minimizing the need to use the instrument. Therefore, there is really a sort of when it works, it's really uh, uh, move a lot of the responsibility on the communication side and less responsibility on the actual use of the instrument. Uh, so actually making the, the monetary policy much, much, much less active uh, and therefore potentially much less uh, disrupting of the development of the economy. And the experience of the last two big crises has shown also that the inflation target is very robust to shocks yeah? because nobody except, uh, except Argentina, nobody that has, uh, uh, that has uh, uh, adopted inflation target in all this year, that now is all this, uh, essentially all the, uh, uh, most of the, of the country, uh, no, nobody has uh, abandoned the inflation target because actually the shock shows the inflation targeting is a very flexible, can absorb a lot of other instruments, uh, can uh, uh, achieve a lot of uh, uh, intermediate objectives uh, without compromising the long-term uh, long stability. But the question then is, remains what, what the target should be, what is the optimal measure of the target? Do we have a problem of the optimal measure of the target? is a discussion that we are having. I personally think on the absolute measure, you know, you know, 4.53, there is no academic paper or empirical estimation that can identify the real advantage of one to another in the absolute measure. What we can think, and we have a paper by, uh, by Rick yesterday about, uh, two days ago about uh, the PPP. One of the things is that it's important what the relative measure is. What is your inflation relative to the inflation of uh, uh, competitors or uh, importer or exporter uh, or where, where you export to imports? So because we, if the exchange rate in, in a world of, of, uh, imperfect, of where the nominal exchange rate do not adjust to make to equalize prices across country, differential in inflation it means that you will have a differential in real, in real exchange rate and uh, uh, an increase in inflation uh, relative to the others will determine a loss of competitiveness of, of the country. If this one, if the adjustment towards the PPP is like uh, in the estimation of RIC around uh, three or four years, even for the same good, in this case it was Apple, uh, it means that you can have a period, a long period of uh, loss of co competitiveness uh, that for which the exchange rate will catch up but a very long time. And this loss of competitiveness that you pay. So therefore, in some sense, there is, we are not alone as a small economy, you are not alone. And your choices are also dependent on what the choice of the others are. And therefore, this one is something that we need to consider, what is the fact. But I think one of the things that is more important is the other thing is there is no real evidence that the target itself you know, is any way connected with that, with the, a, 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 a typical kind of policy. It's not that the low target uh, represent a very conservative monetary policy, the high target represent a very uh, expansionary monetary policy. There is no connection, nor in the data, nor if you think about the country, because you can't uh, think the monetary policy uh, uh, so what is that determine a conservativeness and uh, or uh, an expansionary monetary policy is not determined by the target, but it's determined by your behavior around the target. Uh, how much you respond to shock or how much you focus on one specific thing. And this one is clear in the data. Therefore, what you have in the data is that there is no connection between the high numerical target and you know, the, the type of policy you follow. What is, uh, what is in the data is a connection between the level of the target and the level of the policy rate 
the level of inflation, obviously, because you are targeting higher inflation, therefore you will have on average higher inflation. The policy rate will be on average higher because we will have also to absorb the increase in in inflation, therefore the nominal rate will be higher. Therefore, the, the, the natural rate in the QPM is 7% because there is a, a baseline inflation of 4.5 that is incorporated in the policy rate. But also the real rate is, is tend to be higher because in some sense, uh, you know, you absorb in the real rate part of the risk of higher inflation given the fact that the inflation target is what really give is what is the acceptable uh, range, acceptable level of inflation that the you know, political economy or the, uh, or the economic structure uh, uh, find acceptable. And therefore, higher inflation might mean higher volatility of uh, the nominal and then the real, and this one will be absorbed in, the, in what I think is the real is the real issue that is uh, the, the risk premium attached especially to the long uh, long rate. This one is very much uh, uh, what it comes out from the work we are doing with uh, Ekaterina and uh, Giovanni and uh, Charles really on analyzing uh, uh, deeply the characteristic of monetary policy in emerging countries, uh, particularly South Africa, but really as an example of emerging countries. And one of the things that comes quite strongly is that monetary policy, and I, and I will extend the whole economic policy in emerging countries, only operate a trade-off on a trade-off that you don't find in developed economies. That is a trade-off between short-run interest rate channel, uh, if you want short-run uh, uh, objectives of macroeconomic stability, a long-term, uh, you know, uh, stability of framework and uh, that the two things are not necessarily moving in the same direction that I, like we would expect therefore your action in the short run and your communication in short run give signal about the preference and the expected uh, evolution of the economy but also the evolution of the policy in the in in, in the future and therefore a, a change in the target, it works only if it's a change uh, in uh, the signal of the long-term stability, uh, uh, the long-term stability of the policy. Eh? But the change then can be, should need to be sustainable, therefore it must be a clear change that give a signal, a clear signal that is not only from monetary policy, but is really a, an overall macroeconomic framework that is compati compatible with this long-term uh, stability objective. I just show you one of one of the you know, millions of the results, but I think one result that is interesting. What we do with uh, with Ekaterina and, uh, and the others is really to try to decompose sort of uh, uh, where the monetary policy shock low to and therefore we have uh, a sort of short run effect a sort of the interest rate channel that load the short run and f2 that is the, the medium run effect mainly driven by uh, global shocks and f3 that is really the effect on the risk premium around the uh, long run uh, of the yield uh, or the yield curve essentially what we do here is we monetary policy decision, we, we and we we see we see what is the effect of the monetary policy decision on short run expectation, middle and long run. Looking at what is the effect of that decision on variation on the uh, forward rate, uh, forward ag agreement, and, and other uh, asset pricing. What I and what I want to just to show is just few examples of that kind of things that we experience. So for example, you know, a part of the, the global shock is just to get it fast. One, one thing that, for example, uh, this one is monetary, the monetary policy decision after the firing of Minister Nene, before in January after the firing, and before after all the instability from the, from the, uh, of, on the Treasury side. And the bank responded by increasing the, uh, the, 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 the repo rate by 50 basis points to, to have a very strong, uh, to, to have 
quite a significantly stronger response, also because of the collapse of the exchange rate. This one has got, they absolutely they expect the monetary policy in South Africa works like anywhere else, uh, uh, has got an effect like we expect, a contractionary effect uh, on the short end of the yield curve uh, and exactly like we would expect. But on the long run, has got an expansionary effect because essentially the yield curve or the expected future uh, path of monetary policy actually became expansionary. Right? Therefore, the market reacted to that decision of the contractionary as an indication uh, as an indication that the expected future path of inflation at the fore of the policy rate will be lower because in some sense, the, in that case, you all remember the time, the central bank hold the line against, uh, uh, against the pressure to, uh, to lose uh, the instrument. This is, is in this difference, really, that is what is different in emerging market relative to a lot of, uh, a lot of other uh, you know, the way we think about monetary policy just by looking at developed country. And that is the signal element. I have also here the first COVID shock relative to the second, you know, uh, is almost when you had the first reduction of 100 basis point, you have the expansionary effect in the long run, but it was all in the short run, but in the long run is almost as if the market thought this is not enough. When you uh, one month later you reduce by another one basis point, then both become the whole curve come down quite significantly. In the last decision of increasing the interest rate, there is there hasn't been any change on the long run expectation, just this short run adjustment. The four is when we think about the the, the policy framework, we really think about signaling the policy preferences. Uh, Therefore, what is the role in, in, in structuring the macroeconomic framework so that we anchor the policy preference along period so that this one give more freedom, sort of, if you want, in the short run? If this one, for example, uh, yeah, is, is, I think, an interesting uh, result that we are having, uh, we, we, we will come uh, with, the, with this uh, paper soon, and, but I thought to introduce this, this argument here, uh, that is, I think, the main, uh, for me, the main, the main story. Uh, when we think about external shock, we have similar, a similar problem. The issue about external shock is, you know, the, the literature for now especially after the global financial crisis, really stress a lot the imperfect nature of the global financial market. And the fact the global financial market are essentially transmitting world shock to, or global shock to each country. And therefore there is almost no connection. There is a disconnection between exchange rate movement and capital flow and the actual macroeconomic condition. Uh, we have, you know, the Ray global financial cycle is a, is a very famous one. Uh, the majority Gabe approach focus on particularly of, of these non-financial intermediaries, their ability to absorb risk. And in this uh, uh, workshop, we had at least three papers uh, by Cyril, by uh, uh, Bernard and uh, David yesterday really looking at this uh, different aspect of this, uh, of this process so for how we analyze the exchange rate and we analyze our external environment, given the fact that it's mainly driven by external, by external shock. One of the things about if the exchange rate, if the concept of equilibrium exchange rate is not really a, a policy uh, horizon concept, then it's automatic that in an imperfect market, market, it might be 
worth to intervene in the market to realign the fluctuation of the exchange rate to something that is more efficient relative to uh, the macroeconomic conditions. So therefore, to realign the exchange rate to what the macroeconomic conditions are. This is what comes out from the literature, is what we had yesterday, uh, both with Bernard, in the workshop, both with, with Bernard David, uh, really looking at what kind of policy uh, might, uh, might might work. Uh, the good news is, this one was in the paper of Cyril, that we need to really re uh, think about these shocks, these uh, uh, risk shocks. Actually, they tend to be quite short-lived, short-living. Therefore, that this big deviation, and this one was, in, as I said, in the paper of Cyril, and uh, also in, in, the, in the international work, that there is big shock, but they will tend to be absorbed quite fast. The bad news is the literature always focus of when you want to intervene uh, is about the fiscal capacity of the country overall. It's not only about the budget, uh, the budget constraint. An issue that came in the workshop that I think is interesting is the, is the paper of, uh, um, of Jenny uh, uh, from the Federal Reserve was presented very, as a great paper that put a bit of question on that because really try to decompose, does a very good analysis of decomposing the, the risk premium by how much the risk premium is driven by external element, how much is driven by uh, macro element. And uh, is a quite convincing argument that still the, ma the internal macro still uh, can dominate the evolution of the exchange rate uh, with the, the provision that there is, uh, uh, in, at the national level, there is, we go back to the argument before, there is a very big uh, responsibility to anchor and to give a clear signal that make possible uh, for the, the, the financial intermediaries and the uh, operator to make a decision without uh, the uh, the uncertainty, uh, which we less uncertainty that produce a lot of this fluctuation. Therefore, I thought that the paper of Jenny was really interesting because bridge very well the gap between this literature that talk about international financial market, but also I think from the policymaker point of view, become very difficult to, to control because you can uh, you you always end up falling back on a sort of an equilibrium idea of exchange rate because it's, it's what is useful. The bridge very much this gap between this uh, uh, interpretation of the financial market and the importance of the, of the local signal to go back to what I was saying, uh, I was saying before. And we have looked at, uh, you know, even in the, in, in, during the workshop, really what, what kind of intervention, uh, you know, we can have foreign market intervention, the sort of the traditional reserve, uh, reserve policy. But now there is in the literature a lot of discussion because there is more and more this strong correlation between bond market and foreign exchange market. Actually, the intervention in the bond market, stabilization in the bond market, become a proxy for a stabilization of the exchange rate. But then you do it with your own currency. You don't have, uh, therefore, you're using the balance sheet of the bank. Uh, as a, as a uh, buffer stock for the shock in, uh, in the bond market. Uh, there is a lot of discussion about macroprudential intervention that essentially is uh, breaking the channel between capital flows and credit boom and bust. We have the paper of David yesterday was quite, quite interesting from the point of view. And, and then there is all the discussion uh, capital control uh, about slowing down the speed of transmission. In all this literature, after you end up, and there is, is the issue about having fiscal space. Having fiscal space at the end is about the uh, overall national, national saving capacity. Uh, therefore, at the end is, uh, you know, if you, are, if you can invert the direction of capital flows, and therefore, if you have a saving uh, surplus, all the issue of external stabilities are, are incredibly reduced. And then all the different instruments are much easier, uh, easier to use, but because fundamentally you are given a, a very strong signal of preference uh, of what kind of macroeconomic uh, balance, you, internal micro balance you have. In the use of all the instruments, again, I think 
what I have, what I, I like to emphasize is that I use of instrument. You have to think about what kind of uh, uh, signal of preference it gives. For example, when we talk about uh, intervening the bond market, the issue is always: uh, Are you intervening to deal with uh, a short run uh, exogenous shocks, or does this signal? Uh, some kind of heel control or some kind of change of the role of monetary policy in the macroeconomic framework. Therefore, they always in, or at uh, this one, we can do similar, uh, similar argument for a lot of these instruments. Therefore, again, the clarity of the communication, the clarity of the signal, uh, and the clarity of the message is, uh, I think, fundamental. Uh, even when we decide or when we discuss uh, things like the level of inflation targeting or the kind of intervention we want to do in the foreign exchange market. I don't know if I've been entertaining. I can, Nicola, you've been very entertaining. I can, I can, I can play, <laughs> but I can, uh, I, I talk too much. Bye. No, I think it, and uh, we definitely appreciate your attempts to be entertaining. Uh, uh, and, but also you've raised a number of very, big practical issues um and i wonder if 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 given some of those issues we should hand over to yolandi and yolandi your um thoughts about some of the you know what are the big big things that that nicola is identifying there and how are you guys thinking about that in the work and the project that you're busy with uh, I wanted to put my disclaimer on um, quite explicitly that uh, I'm here to, to air my personal views and not those of Treasury, um, just um, so that we're clear on that part, but thank you. Um, I think for myself, I wanted to start um, probably stepping a little bit back um, and think to the seminar if um, the focus on really low inflation or going towards a lower inflation target could leave less room for uh, monetary policy maneuvering. Now, we've clearly seen um, with the, um, the COVID crisis that the Saab had um, quite a breadth of um, uh, both instruments and space for them to react to that crisis. Um, and it's quite important for us to, to reflect um, if we would move towards a lower target, if we would start getting into the same problems that we see in some of the advanced economies and um, how they are implementing their, their policy and uh, monetary policy. And I think part of that is related to some of the assumptions that we tend to make around monetary policy and implementation there. Um, and um, I've read quite a few papers recently around um, how we think around our assumptions on shocks. So are they only exogenous or are some of these shocks that we tend to react to in monetary policy rather um, something that's an inherent indicator of the unstable dynamics in um, in economies that we don't necessarily acknowledge um, in our policy responses. Um, something uh, else that might be, be interesting for, for some of our uh, listeners uh, or participants in this uh, webinar is the question if monetary policy really only have a transient impact on the real economy. Uh, and that's part of this idea that monetary policy um, levels out some of our business cycle highs and lows? Um, and is that still um, really relevant, uh, specifically in an environment after we've seen the financial crisis? Uh, and possibly lastly, in reference to what's happening in Japan, which is slightly um, quite different from the first two, two assumptions that I want us to really think about, is the assumption that the cost of deflation is really large. Um, and in Japan, we've seen that um, per capita um, growth actually has increased in this same period that we've seen deflation there. A lot of these assumptions um, are talked about in um, 
in spheres where they also mention the financial cycle rather than the business cycle and how important this has become for monetary policy. Um, and then the, the intertemporal trade-offs that we see um, from the financial cycle and the inherent um, um, ways that the financial sector has become so important for monetary policy. So leave it there. There might be a lot of discussion around that. Um, but I think if we then specifically focus in a, a little bit more on the idea that um, this is a time for South Africa to relook really at the inflation targeting framework um, and what that could mean to specifically a change in the target, being at a point target, but also the absolute number. Um, I think a lot of my comments are more related to um, ideas around the timing of changes, um, the magnitude of changes, but also the expected uh, volatility of macro variables during the implementation of these changes. So for instance, um, a lot of focus is being put on the fact that we uh, believe the SOB to be really credible. Um, and we know that um, monetary policy credibility um, and fiscal uh, credibility actually has quite a big interplay. Um, and some of the questions I have there is how much the fiscal policy credibility issues in recent years have weighed on monetary, uh, the monetary policy response. Um, and given that we're still in an environment where fiscal credibility does not seem to, to be um, uh, better down sufficiently, given that we're in a consolidation phase, what would this mean for um, the credibility of the SOB in an unstable and changing environment if we were to look at timing um, inflation targeting changes at the same time? Uh, a little bit around the sacrifice ratio. Um, I think discussions around that has not come out as clearly. Um, I know that um, Nicola mentioned some of the, the fiscal, uh, the Philips Berg work. Um, from our side, um, Treasury has been part of some research that looked at the sacrifice ratio in a stable context. So in the context of the current target, uh, and that has been found to be really, really low. Um, but the question is, what would that look like if you are actually changing that, that context? Would the sacrifice ratio still look that low? Um, and then coming back again to my first um, anchors around timing and magnitude of changes, what does it mean if, the, if we look at any of these changes in the current context where South Africa has got low growth? Uh, where we are concerned about fiscal policy, et cetera. Um, a little yeah, bit I wanted to mention. Let's pause there because that's <laughs> a very long and extremely <laughs> pertinent list. It is. Um, <laughs> and rather than set us up ourselves up to uh, to cover as little as possible. Let's 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 see if we can focus in on some of the the issues that you're identifying, and we can we can come back to other issues that you might have if, if you like. So I think that you know, I mean, let me hand over to Chris and then Mama Kete and then Nicola is the most sensible person in the room to just kind of pull us together. But and there are two questions that I particularly that, that kind of resonated particularly with me in, in what you're identifying there. I mean, you guys are welcome to reflect on some of the others that Yolandi's mentioned. And that is the, 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 the first question um, about uh, whether moving to a lower target would result in less monetary policy room. Um, that's obviously a big policy change. Um, with very important potential costs and benefits and risks. And so I think if we can start to unpack that a little bit. But also, I, th I, I, I think something that is probably very important and not recognized sufficiently, especially in the policymaking environment, is the relationship between fiscal policy and, 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 and monetary policy, if we could reflect on that a little bit. I also think that Yolandi was not only posing those questions 
within the panel. And Yolandi, I'm going to ask you to talk about some of those answers as well. You're not going to get off that lightly. I think that Yolandi was also posing some of those questions to the audience. And so if any of those issues resonated with you, please say so. Um, and if you've got any thoughts or views on it, please also put that in your chat. Chris, over to you. Uh, thanks. Well, I was sort of hoping you'd let Mama Ketty go first uh, so she could, she could uh, be uh, controversial and put some more questions on the table. Look, I, you know, um, I, I'm not sure uh, kind of which way to go. There's been a lot uh, said. <laughs> um, uh, and, um, you know, I, I thought uh, that Nicola um, uh, put out a, you know, a, a tour de force in, um, I think, the right ways to think about the role of monetary policy in macroeconomic policy making in a uh, developing or emerging market context. Uh, and in particular, by highlighting uh, certain areas where emerging markets are just very different from developed markets. Uh, and so therefore, um, how you think about monetary policy, uh, you know, can differ a, a little bit. Um, and probably even more so that relationship between fiscal and monetary policy starts to change in, in pretty important ways. Um, I, in, in particular, uh, I, just to focus in on that particular point, you know, this issue about um, the way in which negative or positive shocks affect the economy and the way in which the economy responds to it is just um, very different. If you're a large closed economy, um, like the US and your factor markets work in this very kind of smooth way where there are no real gaps in the various components of the capital markets and the labor markets are, are quite liberalized. Um, you get a negative demand shock and you get a negative price adjustment or you get deflation or some version of disinflation. And that prices the factors of production back into economic activity which does, which means that your policy responses don't need to be um, as aggressive in part, um, but it, it also means that, um, you know, you can kind of uh, not worry so much about the long term. You can think about this very much in stabilization terms, whereas I don't think for emerging markets that's always true. And as Nicola uh, spelled out uh, in detail, which I really liked a lot, was this the point about, well, what role does the exchange rate and, and the real effective exchange rate play uh, in the way in which you think about um, macroeconomic stabilization policy in an emerging market in the short term? I, those issues are really important. Um, they are very different from the textbook macro view that we all tend to be taught uh, in, in, in school. Uh, and, and frankly, the textbook is a real problem. Uh, so I would encourage people to, to jump into that literature in a much greater depth uh, when, they, when they get the opportunity. Just on the issue of the exchange rate, I mean, look, I think the real, the real trouble there is that exchange rate intervention is always about what you're trying to achieve, right? And if you are an economy like South Africa has been, which is um, made the case that we always want to run current account deficits. So we always want to borrow from the rest of the world to finance growth. That's our growth model. Whether we think that's the best model or not, it's irrelevant. That's the, the one we've chosen. Um, when you're in that position, then of course, doing things that raise the cost of capital uh, are problematic. So you have two kind of paradigmatic policy uh, occurrences of the last 30 years. One was the Asian crisis. And the Asian crisis said, there's a lot of capital coming in. Um, that's part of financial, global financial integration, and it's a given. So what you should do as a macroeconomic policymaker is try to figure out what you adjust on your side to sterilize those inflows so you don't blow up, right? So Thailand, think of Thailand in the early 90s, in the late 90s. 
the, the, the global financial crisis paradigm shifted, frankly, in my view, unhelpfully towards the idea that, which the Brazilians put on the table, which was that, well, we'd rather not adjust our macroeconomic policies when we get all this capital inflow. We just try to prevent it from coming in um, because actually there's a, a set of political economy arguments for why we don't want to be seen to be tightening fiscal and monetary policy. I'm, I'm paraphrasing the argument, there was a little bit more to it, in particular the idea that raising interest rates would bring in more capital, but I don't think empirically that's been shown to be the, the biggest driver of this. What drives capital flows, even though your exchange rate is appreciated and the capital, the, what you're buying in local assets is more expensive, is actually the growth. So if you're overheating and it's growing very fast, then foreign investors pile money in irrespective of what your interest rate is. So anyway, I mean, that's my take on it. People can happily disagree with me about it. Um, but that paradigm said that, well, we still wanna run big uh, investment savings and balances, but we're not really sure about whether or not we want the capital coming in. So we're gonna use a whole bunch of uh, interventions to either prevent it from coming in or steering it in very particular directions. And I think the, the fact of the matter is um, that the jury is out on the effectiveness of many of these sorts of things. And I think in South Africa's case, uh, in large part, the markets have dealt with that problem. So A, we haven't had the capital inflows to anywhere near the same extent as some of these other countries and B, um, having a floating exchange rate and, uh, and absorbing a lot of the capital that has come in through fiscal deficits rather than it going into the private sector has, has made our, uh, our experience with capital inflows very different from some other parts of the world. Um, there's more to that. I mean, I'm quite sympathetic to, to um, an asymmetric uh, foreign exchange intervention strategy based on reserves. That is in fact what we've run since the implementation of inflation targeting. Um, we just you know, don't do it in a very systematic way and we're much more uh, you know, kind of um, opportunistic about how we do this. It was also of course easier to do it in the uh, 2000s when we were running uh, budget surpluses and we had a lot of cash lying around. Uh, so we could sterilize uh, through the treasury. Ultimately, that form of sterilization is about savings. And why it's so important for monetary policy, just coming back to Nicholas' point, is that the link that I think is important to draw here is between having poor macroeconomic policies or bad decisions in macroeconomic policies generating either higher inflation or more foreign exchange rate volatility, which then generates the other one. So if you generate foreign exchange rate volatility, then you generate inflation. If you generate inflation, then you generate foreign currency volatility. That translates in an economy like South Africa's into real exchange rate appreciation. And the long run effect of that is that you're not growing your exports. You're actually you're growing your imports more. You're growing your your non-tradable sectors. Now that may not be a bad thing, um, but you know my take would basically be that South Africa's growth model is too much towards non-tradables and should be more towards tradables, uh, taking more advantage of the global economy. So if you get your macro policy wrong, generating too much FX volatility and too, too much inflation. You're, you're, you're handicapping yourself and that has long run growth effects that are, that are quite important. So just to, to underline um, that particular point uh, that, that Nicola made. And uh, let me just, just say something about the target issue. I'm, you know, I mean, look, I, I think it's very clear um, that you know, the big policy mistake we made in the monetary policy area was not to uh, nail down the target a lot earlier. Um, you know, as the governor loves to repeat, that was part of the plan. Um, for my sins, I drafted the cabinet uh, documentation that set up inflation targeting in 1999, uh, and it was part of the plan. 
we we let it go for bad reasons um and uh you know the damage i think from that has been with us ever since um i do think that um you know a low and specific inflation target is much better for all the kinds of reasons nicola put on the table it's better for communications and in particular i think to answer one of yolandi's very good points is that i think the the tar a low and specific target enhances monetary policy transmission because it is more credible uh, and so you again you get back into this thing of not having to do as much to get a bigger bang uh, from what you're trying to achieve so I, I think that kind of thing and that way of thinking about um, not just monetary policy targets also things like fiscal targets is really very 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 important uh, and and enhances the role of communications in the way in which uh, in the way in which you make policy. Um, I, you know, I think uh, Nicola made the point on the sacrifice ratio. There's really no empirical evidence that that is very large at all. Uh, even though uh, our models that we use put quite a large figure on that. Um, again, this goes back to kind of very long term. Um, estimations of equations of Phillips curve uh, in various forms that uh, I, unfortunately or fortunately tends to change over time. Uh, and my, you know, my impression certainly has been over the last 10 years that uh, if there was a very strong Phillips curve relationship uh, that was exploitable, it was, uh, it's been gone for uh, probably two or three decades. Uh, and certainly doesn't operate very right now uh, very strongly. But of course, um, as central banks and as macro modelers, uh, we always have these kinds of equations. They drive our Taylor rules and they, they play an important role. So for any of you who say, well, okay, Chris doesn't think there's much of a Phillips curve, uh, so therefore the SARBs model is wrong, uh, guess again, our model does exactly show you that. Uh, that's just my view. So uh, just trying to be quick here, on the monetary fiscal uh, coordination point, I mean, look, I mean, again, I, I, I think this is just an important point. Ma good, macro, good, credible macroeconomic policy targets should be medium to long term. They will enforce each other in very important ways. Again, getting back to the kinds of points Nicholas said about volatility and inflation and growth. Um, if if we want to talk about uh, a situation now where fiscal consolidation is, is the plan, then I think the inflation target or lowering the inflation target is very consistent with that. We have uh, public policies that are trying to boost growth, which is disinflationary. We have a fiscal consolidation path, which is trying to take the credit risk premium out of the long end of the yield curve. And it makes sense in that case to lower the inflation target to further deflate the yield curve and make future fiscal policy and debt, uh, debt, debt, uh, debt accumulation cheaper than it has been over the last 10 years. So I think these things are very consistent with each other uh, and there's no real trade-off whatsoever. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, I think, I think what I'm struggling with is to, you know, and I think, and I understand, and I think it's been well explained, the benefits of and and also the role that that plays. Uh, Nicola and co-authors wrote a very nice paper for Ursa a couple of months ago, where uh, called Sailing into the Wind, Evaluating the Near Future of Monetary Policy in South Africa, that I think explains this all very well. Why 3%, why not 4.5%? I haven't I, I don't know if I'm missing something in, in what is being discussed, but that that's 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 where I'm at. I'm going to hand over to Mamakete, um, and then because you know you 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 had said you would like it to go before you, so I'm going to try and correct that, and then allow you to come back, or maybe uh, Nicola wants to take a stab at kind of um, framing that specific cost-benefit dynamic that you guys are, are busy grapp grappling with. Thanks, Matthew. Gosh, there's been so much said. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> like articulating my thoughts about which part of what was said. Um, but I'm gonna just talk about, say, recent history and our experience with monetary policy um, in certain phases. 
um, and, and bring, in, um, bring it back to um, all the comments um, of the people that spoke before me. So um, in Nicola's um, presentation, he made the point that the inflation target should be a focal point and coordinating device within the economy. And that's how um, you get the maximum benefit from, um, from it. And you eventually reap the benefit of having lower inflation, et cetera, et cetera. What we've seen in South Africa is that in the earlier part of inflation targeting, you definitely had um, that sort of um, collapse into the target at around 6% um, by public sector price setters. Um, and it took a while for the private sector to catch up. Um, but what we've seen in the past 10 years has been the, the exact opposite, where um, the private sector has sort of come to the party probably because demand had collapsed, um, but public sector prices have remained very, very high or public sector price inflation has remained quite high. If you look at, um, uh, if you look at, you know, um, administered price inflation, um, you know, away from fuel, et cetera, it sits somewhere between six and 8% over time. So in the effort um, by the SAF, say over the past um, seven years or so to get the inflation target closer to four and a half, you've had to, you know, you've run private sector inflation well below that four and a half to compensate. Um, and unfortunately, the tool that um, the SAB uses, which is um, um, monetary policy, affects private sector demand. So it means that you have to, to run demand so low that you collapse your private sector inflation quite a bit below um, at around maybe three and a half or so, uh, or four or four percent then thereabouts. And then your on aggregate, your average, average inflation is at four and a half. And I think this is a question that now needs to be asked if you're considering um, you know, taking the inflation target further low, so from four and a half to three, um, where's that price adjustment going to come from? We know evidently that the public sector is unresponsive and they're not responsive to demand, right? Because they, they, their product is um, demand inelastic. So it, it would mean that you would have to push um, private sector um, prices further um, in order to get um, the kind of gains that you need on inflation. And I think when we think about monetary policy implementation, this is something that we really need to think about, which prices. It really shouldn't be because you should be looking at prices on the headline level and the you know, private sector or public sector pricing affects private, private sector pricing, et cetera. But there is this dynamic. Um, I think that is, is quite important because that coordination is not um, really happening. And um, are you going to get the buy-in from um, other public sector price setters before you, you start to try and get this, um, this, this new inflation target? Because even at four and a half, it's, it's evident that um, there's no coordination as far as, um, as, far as that's concerned. So that, that, that's the one thing. And then, then um, if you then go back to say the period into 2019, I mean, 2019, this economy was in recession. Um, and in the period prior, um, you know, the way investment was, was, was actually occurring was suggestive of monetary policy that was actually quite tight. And there was this tussle between is monetary policy tight, is it loose, et cetera. Um, and as inflation went to four and a half and, um, you know, it maybe trended even slightly below that, um, there was a sense in which the Reserve Bank was not necessarily very responsive to you know, the outcomes that are coming up that were suggesting that monetary policy was tighter uh, than, than that four and a half suggestion or had been run um, quite a bit tighter. We don't know by how much. So you know, that there's, there's also that, that responsiveness. And, and I suppose what I'm trying to say within this is that you know, you've got to tolerate maybe a little bit of variability um, and be willing to allow inflation to actually um, sit within the bands, whatever those bands are, in order um, you know, to be more business cycle friendly um, and reduce the probability that you make you know, errors, um, you know, policy mistakes where maybe policy is too tight or maybe policy is too loose, whatever the case may be. But there's a certain asymmetry, I think, that has been evident um, in the Saab 
um, response function over the past um, seven years or so that suggests uh, that the Saab is, is very intolerant of taking risks on inflation to the high side, which is consistent, I suppose, with, you know, Yolanda's point that she makes about monetary policy versus fiscal policy, and that as fiscal policy became less credible, maybe a lot of that, a lot of the heavy lifting moved on to the, to the monetary policy side and, 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 and all of those, um, those kinds of things. So I think it's... it's um, that that's that that's that's another another thing that when you when you look at it historically and you say okay fine you're going to push the inflation target lower, um, what does that imply? Um, Chris made the point that the sacrifice ratio is probably very low, uh, but from my discussions with uh, members of the MPC previously, they had suggested that it was low, but it wasn't um, negligible. So the question becomes then, you know, you have periods in time where you might as an economy um, have a high tolerance for paying whatever the sacrifice ratio is, bearing in mind that it is not, it's probably not static. Um, it depends on, on, the, on, on whatever the, the economic conditions are, uh, but you have an estimate based on what happened historically, but you know you, you're, gonna, you're going to be out. So you are taking a risk and you have to ask yourself of the many risks that are out there, which ones are you willing to take? Which takes me uh, back as opposed to one of the points that was made by Nicola in his presentation that you know, the, the, you want the inflation targets to be credible. Um, and Chris said credible and low, but the question is what is low? What, what makes 3% superior to four and a half? Um, and what is important? Is it more important that it is low and credible? Um, and South Africa is one of the most credible central banks, I think in emerging markets, uh, or is it important that um, it's low? Um, even if by virtue of you pulling it lower, you might run the risk that it becomes less credible because it runs into other headwinds, like uh, you know, an economy that's that that's quite uh, that's quite um, you know that that's quite weak, etc. So you know that those are those are the, some of the points that are sort of that that sort of came to to mind um, for me. And then the other thing is um, Chris makes the point that if you lower the inflation targets, you lower the curve, it lowers um, the cost of borrowing for, um, for the government, et cetera. Um, and, and, and I think, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's a reasonably um, well-made point. But what I, what I wonder about though, is if you, um, there must be a trade-off somewhere, that there must be a way you make the calculation around what happens when you lower nominal growth, um, nominal growth rates. Um, what is what is the cost of that to um, to the fiscus, and um, what does that mean for um, how quickly your debt stock adjusts relative to GDP, and um, how do you play off those two dynamics? Um, so essentially, you would want to have the the consolidation coming through quickly enough that that dynamic um, then doesn't become damaging um, in line with what, what what you've done on the on the inflation side. So for me, I think it's not clear to me that a lower rate, a lower inflation um, target or lower inflation over time is um, on the, on the, at face value, the best sort of outcome that you want. It has to be coordinated. Um, and it's, it's not particularly clear to me that given the uncertainty that you have um, around the fiscal picture at the moment, you can right now in South Africa in, in the early part of 2022, uh, or over the course of 2022 as a whole, actually, um, make the point that you are sufficiently comfortable that those equations um, are balanced. Um, I'm going to stop there um, just to just to put the, the questions back. Uh, Thank you very much, Mamadeli. That was very helpful and I think important. A um, couple of questions in the q and I think Bradley's question is quite uh, similar to the questions myself and Mama Kete have raised. Uh, Nicola, a question to you from Ifioma um, and Chris, I don't know, Paul rates. Um, but I think let's look to continue with this conversation and to the extent that you can fold in some response to those questions in the discussion, that would be very helpful. Chris, you wanted to come back on this uh, on this issue. Yeah, uh, thanks. I'm not sure I can multitask and deal, deal with Q&A as well. Um, I expect to type as you talk. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, the, the, the question of what the target is, I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, there's two components to that. I mean, one of them is, um, you know, back to a point Nicola made earlier on, which is that if everybody in the world has an inflation rate of 3% and ours is four and a half or six or whatever, um, unless your exchange rate is constantly depreciating, which adds to the risk premium for the economy, you are losing competitiveness. So you pay an interest rate cost all the time permanently for having an inflation rate that is higher than the rest of the world. So if the rest of the world sits at 3%, which you know, a, a pretty simple comparative view will tell you is true for emerging markets, um, then it seems like a pretty sensible thing to do. That's point one. The second point is that, you know, I think you've got to decide, um, you know, what kind of growth you want. If you want growth that's driven by long-term investment, then you want to get that yield curve flat permanently through sensible policies with a lower inflation rate. If the inflation rate is getting in the way of that yield curve being permanently flat, then I think you've got a problem. If you think that you can exploit uh, a short-term uh, surprise in inflation continuously to get more growth, then yeah, by all means, um, have a higher inflation rate. I would just point out to you that if you look at the long-term, and I'm happy to throw some slides up if, if that would help, um, you know, South Africa's growth experience has been poor with higher inflation, period. There's no debate about that. So, so, so the short-term Phillips curve argument is this, that if we generate surprise inflation, then the real cost of production in the economy falls because no one is indexed quickly enough. And therefore, Everybody produces more for some period of time. And then when that indexation kicks in, which is, uh, it's an old theory, it's called real wage bargaining or real income bargaining in economy it comes from the 1970s. Once that kicks in, then you have higher inflation and everybody has to retrench because now your real exchange rate is appreciated. Your interest rates are higher and no one is profitable enough anymore. So if you think you can play that game all the time, <laughs> so generate surprise inflations again and again and again, you know, then that's fine. And that's, by the way, I think is exactly the answer to the fiscal question. It is true that there is a transition cost, as Mamaketi said, to the fiscus by having lower inflation. But that is really only true if it is a surprise disinflation. If the fiscal authorities are part of the disinflation trajectory, which arguably they are because they're trying to engineer a fiscal consolidation currently, then there shouldn't be a surprise uh, and the transition costs would be, would be minimized uh, and the sacrifice ratio would be minimized because both the monetary and fiscal authorities would be saying the same thing about future inflation. Now, you know, sure, uh, credibility goes up and down, um, but if you are able to say the same thing convincingly and you're pulling policy levers or, you know, set out a trajectory for the economy that shows how this works, um, then I think then I think you can generate very high credibility and whatever disinflation costs uh, you might have are very small. I mean, I agree that there's a short term fiscal issue. Uh, that has to be dealt with, but the permanent gains from the lower yield curve uh, infinitely outweigh whatever the short-term costs actually look like. Thanks. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Let me just let me just say one other thing. Just on one of the points Mama Keddy made. I mean, just to harp on this again. I mean, if if six percent inflation, which is what we tolerated between 2011 and 2016, roughly was good for growth, it should, certainly didn't show. The growth decline that we had in the wake of the global financial crisis over the last 10 years has been largest in that period between 2011 and 2014, when the inflation rate was sitting at 6%, and our real interest rates were actually negative in that period. I can also show you a graph showing how real interest rates have generated 
uh, uh, positive growth rates, but we, I'm sure we don't need to go into that. Thanks very much, Matthew. Thanks, Chris. I mean, we could go on about this all afternoon, but I'm worried that kind of after 3.30, we're going to experience a significant brain drain. So I want to try and wrap this up uh, quite quickly. Um, so let's do this. Nicola, do you want to add to that? And then Mama Kete, uh, well, Yolandi, if you want to come in, you're very welcome to. Mama Kete, you can then um, respond. If we've got a few minutes left, um, please pick a couple of the questions that you might want to very quickly address. Some of the questions are quite direct and I think uh, useful. Uh, well, they're all useful. Let me not be disrespectful. Um, and then, yeah, the, we'll close quickly with that final round of comments about where we're failing in policy and where we would like to see further research or where we need to see further research. Over to you, Nicola, if you want to come in. Yeah, from my point of view, uh, from my point of view, is uh, I like the debate because it is really what it should, uh, is supposed to be. Because the discussion about the multi framework cannot be separated from the overall discussion about the macroeconomic framework and the, the growth strategy that we have. So the, the monetary policy cannot be analyzed in isolation relative to the structure of the economy, to the, to the external condition, et cetera. Therefore, it is, uh, is useful, I think, that since starting the conversation on the on the target, we get to what are the real critical uh, the real uh, critical issue and a change in the target or a, a, a rethinking about the monetary policy must be contextualized in a, in in a wider thinking about the role of fiscal policy. What is the role of uh, administration? How the administrative prices uh, or the uh, public provision, uh, public resource services uh, end up being the, uh, you know, the, 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 the real drag on a lot of, on a, on a lot of this, uh, of this thing. I think it's very useful to, uh, to how the things are not disconnected. For example, when we consider, even when we consider, Mamoketa rightly uh, pointed out the, the period of when the bank was not reducing the interest rate, although we were, we had uh, uh, significant reduction in inflation, that was actually a very interesting because we we were almost in where you you were almost incredulous by the you know estimation of what the potential growth was or where the economy was growing. Whatever model you were using it will tell you that you were going back to a some uh, some mean reversion because you were thinking about the cycle. But that was not cycle. This was an economy that is was tanking and is keep on tanking. And therefore, the issue of the credibility of monetary policy or the credit cannot be separated from the issue of the credibility of the, of the overall system. And this one, I'm totally convinced. That's why a sort of in this one, a very a sort of structuralist. You cannot separate the macroeconomic analysis from what the actual uh, uh, condition and structure of the economy, uh, the economy are. And uh, even even the issue of the sacrifice ratio. Yes, you are absolutely right. It is low, but we can say it is low in the specific period we are looking at. But it, we cannot be sure be absolutely sure that it is going to be low. And that is going to be low in any condition. The only thing I am, when I was looking, when we look at these, you know, short run effect and long term effect, these two effects happen at the same time. And therefore, they are not, I think, if uh, the credible setting of, of the policy is, is where you find the possibility of, you know, the long-term stability giving you now a gain, uh, and a sort of an expansionary gain. Uh, is very well, you know, but it's about what the long-term growth is, long-term growth, uh, growth uh, paradigm you choose, uh, and how this is compatible with uh, your position, uh, the South Africa position as a small open economy, dependent on international capital flows. Uh, uh, this one is, you know, the four, you know, it's true. 4.53 don't mean much 
if you don't deal Chaifan at the same time, you embedded this in a much wider uh, thinking uh, about what, how macroeconomic policy should be conducted in South Africa. This one, I'm, I'm totally, uh, totally convinced. But the rest is, you know, I already talked a lot. Thank you, Nicola. I think that's a very important kind of point to end on uh, and your kind of comments on. Yolandi, do you want to reflect on this at all? There's quite a bit to reflect on, I think, um, but probably the this idea around um, the fact that we, uh, that the exchange rate is making um, the adjustment for us because our inflation rate is so much higher than um, quite a bit of our global peers. I think if we look at the actual targets, they're all, all mostly close to 3%. I think it's a little bit different if we look at the actual inflation outcomes. And I know that Turkey and Argentina might skew some of those calculations, uh, but it does beg the question, um, you know, how much does the exchange rate then, um, then have to, to balance this out for us? Um, and given that we've now moved from uh, a long-term period of targeting more around the upper band, to targeting um, implicitly the 4.5%, um, how much would that give us in, uh, in room um, in, our, in our policy going forward rather than moving directly down into 3%. But I think the, the arguments around the absolute numbers is probably the ones that's gonna be um, most heated um, in, in time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mama Kete, do you want to have the last word on this? Um, no, I, mean, I, mean, I just, I, I think there's a lot more um, that needs to be debated. Uh, I really liked um, Yolanda's uh, point about, um, you know, what has, what has happened with respect to inflation outcomes in a lot of these inflation targeting regimes. Um, and I also, I suppose, when, when one thinks about the inflation targeting and you say, you know, we've just moved from 6% effectively to four and a half, and then we want to move it again. Um, do we really want to do it now? Um, do we want to do it in, in, over such a short period of time? Um, these are like, for me, these are all questions that, that bug me. So th there's no doubt that low inflation um, not 2%, I think 2% target has been proven to be quite problematic, but a lower inflation uh, um, target is more preferable to a higher one. But um, I think also you, you cannot pretend that the move from one to the next is without some cost. Um, and you need to look at the environment and say, is this a cost that the, the, the economy can bear? Is this a cost that the fiscus um, is prepared to accommodate? All of those things. So, you know, yeah, 3% three, 3 in theory looks better than four and a half, but we've got to think really, really hard about that. And then the other thing, I mean, this is the last point that I'm going to make is around um, the, the Reserve Bank using tools other than macro, uh, or rather than interest rates, uh, when you have imbalances within the economy. And this is one of those places where I think the South hasn't done um, as well as it could have. Um, if you think about um, you know, specific um, issues around credit, um, credit demand, um, you know, in the latter part of the last decade, it was a big issue around where's the price for credit actually, uh, where's prime, all of these things. And um, there was a, a certain level of unresponsiveness. Um, I think into the crisis, there's a lot of question marks still around the use of the um, of the of the of the guarantee scheme beyond just the, the you know the normal tools in order to to support business the business cycle and business activity. And I think this is one of those things that also came through with with what Nicola said. And I think that's that's maybe maybe what we should also talk about and say. Are we using everything available to us beyond just the repo rates? Thank you, Mama Kete. And um, I know I said I was gonna give you the last word, but I've, I've, I've known all of you a long time and I can feel that Chris is itching and I'm quite enjoying this. So um, let's, let's, see if, let, let's see if he can have the last word. 
I wasn't, I wasn't, you, know, you could feel I was itching, I was itching. Um, <laughs> no, look, I mean, look, I think this has been a great discussion and, um, I, you know, I would welcome more of it and for a longer period of time. Um, you know, again, I, I think the really important issue here is about, um, you know, are your long-term policy settings right? And I, you know, I know Mama Ketty is very worried that, that suddenly the inflation target is going to be changed to 3%. I, I'm not really sure that that's, that that's happening anytime soon. And I don't think anybody here <laughs> has said it would. Um, so uh, if you're really worried about the timing, I, I think um, you don't need to worry quite so much. Um, that's the one point. I, you know, I, I think that the other thing about administered prices is that, you know, administered prices is, shouldn't be seen as exogenous. I mean, they have to be seen as endogenous to the inflation target and to, and to um, fiscal policy. Um, the fact that electricity prices have gone up and contributed so much to administered prices um, is a particular function of policy decisions made. The, the fact of the matter is that electricity prices in relative terms had to go up. Uh, the problem is, is that they went up in a very slow way and continuously in an environment where um, we are not producing enough energy, right? So, 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 you know, the solution to that problem isn't to uh, say, well, we should have 15% inflation because that private sector can raise prices and then suddenly the electricity price problem is, is, doesn't seem as bad. But of course, that's nonsense because the electricity prices will go up by whatever multiple the headline has gone up because it's a relative price adjustment. It is a real income shift from one economic agent to another uh, that, that is outside of the bounds of monetary policy. I'd also say, just make the point that, of course, core inflation, which is not our headline target, but it is something we look very carefully at, doesn't, doesn't include it. Um, just one last point, Matthew. I mean, I, I think th this other point about the use of guarantees and all that stuff, I think that's absolutely right. You know, the, the problem with every crisis is that, you know, I mean, many people have said this, is that we're always looking at the last one and figuring out what we should do to deal with the last one, and then the next one comes, comes around. I think in this crisis, we were incredibly lucky that inflation fell because it allowed us to adjust interest rates. In no previous crisis has that actually happened. Um, and that higher inflation has squeezed the economy further rather than allowed the fiscal and monetary authorities to respond. So this pandemic has been unique in a sense because it's operated more like what, what developed economies were able to do. We were able to extend fiscal policy. We were able to expand monetary policy. We got quite a lot of exchange rate stability because it so happened that the terms of trade uh, improved. So there were certain things that happened that made, made this for us uh, much better than they could. But policy always must improve. And, and I totally agree with the issue about guarantees. I mean, we should have had a lot more guarantees on joblessness, et cetera, et cetera, like in some other countries. But those are fiscal measures primarily, not monetary. Thanks. Right. I think we're coming to the end um, and should wrap up quite quickly. But I do want to uh, just take that run of, 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 of questions. Where is the policy failure? What is the research you would like to see people doing? Um, let's start with Yolandi on that, then Mama Kete, then Chris and uh, Nicola can end. Nice and quickly, please. Okay, so I think from my side, um, it's probably a little bit between macro prudential and monetary policy. And the question that I would like to see more um, work on is, um, the fact that inequality is being recognized um, more often now as a contributing factor to financial instability um, and also asset market inflation. Uh, and the question is, should we only be looking at asset market inflation and some of the financial instability issues just through macroprudential regulations or can a monetary response also influence inequality in a way that supports macroprudential regulations 
uh, for financial stability and asset markets. Thanks. I can't remember who I said would go next. Um, so I think you said, um, you said me. So if I, if I think about, you know, the, the, the areas of, poly, of, of, um, of research that I'd, I'd like to see done a little bit more. So, you know, the, 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 the interaction between uh, monetary policy and, um, and, and interest rates, obviously I'd, I'd say that because that's, that's what I do. Uh, but there, the, 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 there's the, the, how, the, how the, the, the whole curve and how you see the curve translate into the appropriateness of monetary policy um, for a country like ours, I think it's still a little bit undefined. And, and people have been speaking a lot about how steep the curve was and um, how monetary policy transmission actually works or doesn't work. Um, and I think, you know, when the Saab looks at um, how they read the curve relative to what they, sh they should be doing, whether it be um, on break-evens or in any of those kinds of measures, um, and then they look at things like the risk premium, and then they try and infer what the long-term appropriate real rate is. I think that to me is, is at the moment, it's that the whole relationships are quite untidy. Um, and, 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 and there's quite a lot of tightening that needs to happen there, especially because we did speak about how, you know, there, there's a link, the links between currency, uh, between rates, um, and between monetary policy. So obviously these things are feeding back into the policy stance. Um, and, and I think, for instance, I personally think Saab has, and I, and I know I'm not the only person, has read the whole um, global real rate story um, and global financial flows, et cetera, um, quite wrong um, in the cycle. Cool. I think I said Chris next. Uh, well, look, I think the, the interaction between interest rates and the real effective exchange rate is very important. Um, but, you know, I think the real game is how do you create jobs? I don't think that we've uh, cracked that one. Thanks. Cool. Nicola, Professor Vieggi is the most sensible person in the room. Take us home. Uh, I'll go ahead and do the research. What can I do? <laughs> <laughs> you you, you gave me you gave me the the homework. I'm going I'm going guys uh, guys in the in this audience. There is a lot of academics there. Yeah. There is a lot of uh, friends and work. We we are we'll we'll try to answer this question. We'll we'll try to work. Some uh, was in this workshop. We'll have more uh, more things uh, coming uh, next year. Uh, keep online and we will uh, we will talk again. Excellent. Well, you know, thank you to you and Samnet for taking the initiative to set up this discussion. Um, I think we might not have succeeded in our ambitions to be entertaining, but I appreciate all of your efforts. I think we have succeeded in providing an interesting contribution on the policy and hopefully giving some indications to the audience about where the issues lie and what kind of research might be important and useful going forward. So with that said, um, let me wrap up very quickly to thank the audience very, very much for your attention and your time, not just for today, but those of you that were part of the previous uh, two uh, sessions of the SAMNET workshop. The speakers, especially, uh, you know, the, to give of your time and to give of your views and your opinions in this way, I think it's 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 extremely important to the rest of us in the broader community, and it's a it's a great contribution and an important contribution to the national debate. I think we saw the importance of this kind of debate on important and pertinent policy issues today. Um, and yeah, not to take up anyone else's time, but thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>